Welcome everyone to Healthy Aging Part 2, Maintaining Your Health and Wellness, a sequel to the first Healthy Aging event held last September. The College of Health has teamed up with the University of Utah Alumni Association to bring you a remarkable lineup of speakers to present on their research that may benefit aging individuals on how they may maintain or improve their health. I am Dave Perrin, Dean of the College of Health. The College of Health is leading a complex shift in healthcare by advancing the industry's ability to prevent chronic illness, restore health, and maintain wellness. We are doing so by developing and implementing innovative science and educating the next generation of practitioners and researchers. Before we begin with our first presentation, I would like to introduce you to our speakers, all current or retired faculty members in the College of Health. Our first speakers are Dr. Wayne Askew and Dr. Thunder Jalili. Dr. Askew served as professor and director of the Division of Nutrition in the College of Health at the University of Utah from 1994 to 2015, where he taught metabolism, sports and environmental nutrition and conducted research on nutrition and human health and performance. Prior to coming to the University of Utah, he was chief of military nutrition research for the US Army at the US Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine. He has served as a member of the nutrition advisory panel to the United States Olympic Committee and the US Food and Drug Administration Advisory Committee on Food Safety. He was a member of the Committee on Military Nutrition of the Food and Nutrition Board, National Academy of Sciences. Wayne retired in 2015 and now is a Professor Emeritus in the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology at the University of Utah. Dr. Thunder Jalili is a Professor in the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology. Dr. Jalili came to the U in 1999 and has taught undergraduate and graduate courses in nutrition and metabolism. He has maintained a research program centered around the role of nutrition to prevent various aspects of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and vascular damage. Since 2016, Dr. Jalili has served as Director of Graduate Studies and Undergraduate Studies. Prior to coming to the U, he received his BS and PhD from The Ohio State University in Nutrition, Biochemistry, and Molecular Biology. Thunder completed postdoctoral fellowships at the Harvard School of Public Health in the Cancer Biology Department and at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center in the Division of Cardiology. Our next speaker will then be Dr. Justin Rigby. Dr. Rigby is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training at the University of Utah. Dr. Rigby earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Utah, master's degree from Texas State University, and his doctorate from Brigham Young University. His primary research focuses on the effectiveness of therapeutic physical agents for injury and exercise recovery. Justin has been an athletic trainer since 2008. He has worked in a variety of settings as an athletic trainer, including a high school, a rehabilitation specialist at a physical therapy clinic, and collegiate club hockey. We will then transition to uh, Tracy Thompson. Tracy is an associate professor of health and kinesiology at the University of Utah. She's a, a certified health fitness director and certified cancer exercise trainer through the American College of Sports Medicine and a certified strength and conditioning specialist to the National Strength and Conditioning Association. She has been the director of Peak Health and Wellness since 2001. Peak offers a variety of classes, workshops, and seminars, health assessment and fitness testing, nutrition services, and evidence-based programs to university employees, students, and community members. Finally, we'll transition to uh, Dr. Dar. Schmaltz and Dr. Camilla Hodge. Uh, Dr. Uh, Schmaltz is an associate professor and researcher in parks, recreation, and tourism. Her research focuses on the relationships between recreation and leisure behavior on physical, mental, and emotional health. Dr. Schmaltz holds a BA from the College of Worcester in history, 
with a concentration in environmental sciences, an MS from Penn State University in leisure studies with a concert, uh, concentration in services marketing, and a PhD from Penn State in leisure studies with a minor in health and sports psychology. Upon completing her PhD in 2004, Dart held a position as a research associate in the Childhood Obesity Research Lab at Penn State. Prior to coming to the University of Utah, she was an associate professor in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management at Clemson University. And finally, Dr. Camilla Hodge is an assistant professor in Parks, Recreation and Tourism. Her research focuses on shared leisure experiences and social connection, particularly in families. Camilla received a BA in communication from BYU, her master's in youth and family recreation from BYU, and completed her PhD in parks, recreation, and tourism at North Carolina State University. Now, let's get started with Dr. Wayne Askew. Thank you, Dean Perrin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here this evening to speak to you on positive health and an active lifestyle and how nutrition can help our healthy aging as we undergo these processes. And I want to ask you if it isn't really finally time to start eating what your mother told you to eat, if you remember those days. And can this even be accomplished without uh, eating broccoli? That's the eternal nutrition question. Maybe we can address both these things and, and get to a little bit of specific information how the phytonutrients in certain fruits and vegetables can help in the aging process. Uh, healthy aging uh, can be achieved with a wide assortment of fruits and vegetables, particularly the brightly colored ones, red, yellow, green, purple. And the reason why is they contain a specific nutrient found in broccoli, which allows you to get this particular nutrient without even eating broccoli. So I wanna talk about plant polyphenols. They're plant phytonutrients and they're called flavonoids and they are beneficial to the aging process. First, let's take a look at aging patterns in the United States. Uh, America is, is gradually graying. And by this, we mean uh, people are living longer. If you look at uh, 1900 and uh, only 4% of the population was over age 65. And now currently 18% of the population is over age 65. So we're living longer. So this poses a question that I'd like to pose to you is as long as we're hanging around longer, <laughs> why not do all we can to more fully enjoy the benefits of this life extension? I'd like to give you some examples of what we call positive aging. Uh, this is Grandma Emma Gatewood, who uh, was the first uh, woman to uh, hike the complete Appalachian Trail. And she, she did it three times and the last time at age 75. This is Walt Stack, a Bay Area uh, celebrity who uh, famously ran 17 miles before breakfast, logged in over 61,000 miles in his lifetime and ran marathons up into his 80s. And you'll probably recognize our 41st president of the United States here, George H.W. Bush, who famously uh, skydived to celebrate his 90th birthday. Well, your goals of healthy aging may not be exactly the same as these folks. You may have more limited goals. For example, you may want your very own parking place as you get more senior in the workplace. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's nice to have a reserved parking place. However, it might not be so nice if it was really one of these type of parking places. And I'd like to say that we want to try and become more like this guy here on the left than the other individual, if at all possible, as we age. The Center for Disease Control uh, put out a monograph on roadblocks to uh, healthy aging. And they listed some key indicators of well being and roadblocks to this well being. And one of the roadblocks was chronic disease. And they make the point that aging itself, uh, thank goodness, is it's not really a disease. It's, a strong, it's just a risk factor. It's a risk factor for a, a certain age-associated chronic diseases. And here's a few of these chronic diseases that come on uh, ever increasingly after the age of 65, afflict us senior citizens. 
And some of the more prominent ones are heart disease, hypertension, cancer, diabetes, and arthritis. These are the things that make our senior years uh, less enjoyable. So the concept of positive health does not necessarily mean the absence of chronic diseases. We're probably never going to get entirely be able to get rid of chronic diseases, but we can lessen their effect. And positive health is characterized by a higher quality of physical health as we age. This will help us with a lower incidence or severity of these chronic diseases and better prognosis when chronic disease or illness does strike and lower health care expenditures. And I'd like to make the point that positive nutrition and an active lifestyle are really the foundations for positive health. So how do we go about circumventing uh, these roadblocks to healthy aging uh, by using nutrition? Think of nutrition kind of as a, a tool or a prescription that can allow us to uh, lessen or get around some of these roadblocks that are limiting our enjoyment as we go into our senior years. This is a review article from Nature, fairly recent, where they were investigating the therapeutics for healthy aging. One of the conclusions they came to was that Diet is one of the most important influences on healthy aging. Optimal eating uh, increased life expectancy and causes a reduction from the risk of chronic disease. Well, what do we mean by optimal, optimal eating for healthy aging? Do we have to eat broccoli? Well, uh, once again, apparently not. And we'll use uh, our former president for an example of this. He famously made this statement that he did not like broccoli and wasn't going to eat it. And you know, he did pretty well. He lived to be age 94. So God bless George Bush in America. You don't really have to eat broccoli if you don't want to because there are other nutrients, other fruits and vegetables that can supply vitamin nutrients. But don't uh, completely uh, disregard broccoli, it's a good source of nutrients, particularly in this one in the lower right-hand corner, flavonoids. And that's the one that I wanna spend the rest of my talk on. And I call this to broccoli and beyond because there are a lot of other choices where you can get these flavonoids without eating broccoli if that's not your particular cup of tea. Well, where can we get flavonoids? Well, as I said, brightly colored fruits and vegetables. Flavonoids is a general term for a group of polyphenol compounds that have, each have some specific, and yet they all have some common uh, characteristics affecting metabolism. These are some common names for uh, some of the uh, flavonoids. Perhaps you're familiar with some of them, such as quercetin. And I'd like to direct your attention to this one down here, uh, ap epigenin. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to show you the central position of fla uh, flavonoids in human cellular metabolism. It does a lot of things. It has act they have activities that are anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, uh, antiviral, anti-carcinogenic. And they do this by uh, activating certain pathways that reduce inflammation. And this particular flavonoid that I mentioned in the previous slide, epigenin, is a flavonoid that's found in celery and parsley. And it has the ability to modulate the inflammatory response that occurs in osteoarthritis. You'll see here osteoarthritis is characterized by an inflammation of the cartilage in between the bones that eventually wears away and you have bone on bone and intense uh, pain. We see that the apigenin uh, acts by uh, inhibiting some transcription factors and these transcription factors are anti-inflammatory and they can ease the burden of this inflammation that is troubling our joints and make the pain a little bit more bearable and slow down the cartilage uh, decay. I'd like to share with you uh, three uh, examples of how flavonoids can benefit some of these chronic diseases. The first one is uh, on the upper left-hand corner is uh, flavonoids have some uh, effect on the cognitive impairment of aging, thank goodness. Now that's promising to a lot of us. And they also have a neuroaffective effect that is uh, useful in the protection against Parkinson's disease. And perhaps most important, they have certain anti-cancer properties that can modulate the expression of genes that are involved in metastasis or the progression of cancer. 
Well, how can we go about getting uh, flavonoids in our, in our diet? Well, it's really easy. Just to do like your mom told you, eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, particularly the brightly colored ones. I showed some uh, good sources here on the right. If you, the typical uh, adult daily intake of flavonoids is, is around 200 to 250 milligrams per day. And what we call the clinical effective dose, in other words, the amount that's used in some of these studies that I just presented in the previous slide is about uh, two or three times that amount, 500 to 900 milligrams per day. So is this achievable by, uh, by your diet alone? Uh, yes, it is. I wanna show you some food choices here. If you would simply add one serving of blueberries, an apple, an onion, and a cup of green tea to your daily intake of uh, fruits and vegetables, you could raise the, your intake to the lower level, the lower level of these clinical effective doses. But we have a secret weapon here that allow us to get even higher. And that secret weapon is that dark chocolates are high in flavonoids. So as an example, if we take our daily intake of 225 milligrams, add a few supplemental food choices as in the previous slide, and then simply add one dark chocolate source to it, we're at 803 milligrams per day, which is the upper level of the clinically effective dose. So very feasible. Well, uh, in any of my presentation, I'd like to give you my own personal prescription for happy aging. And I call this happy angling. And it goes something like this. Uh, retire, first of all, so you've got time for all this uh, activity and healthy aging advice. Uh, be sure and, and get plenty of aerobic exercise every day to keep yourself in shape. Practice balance and agility, really important for preventing falls as you approach the senior years. And have a positive attitude and be resourceful. And finally, eat well, particularly uh, add a lot of flavonoid rich fruits and vegetables to your diet. And repeat this advice uh, at least three times a day or even more. That's all folks, and I wanna thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for that. I had my computer was frozen. I couldn't turn on my video and I couldn't activate my, my microphone, but hopefully now everybody can hear me and see me. Um, so I'm gonna operate under the assumption that you can hear me and see me at this point. Um, I, appreciate, I appreciate this opportunity to, to talk a little bit about supplements and COVID-19. I think this is a very timely topic. A lot of people have been interested in this. Um, so I'm going to address, uh, are there any supplements out there that can be used to either prevent our risk for COVID-19 or perhaps um, reduce the severity of disease? So uh, I'm going to focus on four supplements, um, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, and fish oil. And the way I'm going to uh, handle these is I'll first talk a little bit about the rationale of what is the theory behind why they may be helpful. And then I will comment on any human studies that have been done with these supplements. And then I'll um, finish with a specific recommendation for each supplement. So let's get started and we'll start with vitamin D. Um, before I go into vitamin D specifically, I do want to take a moment to talk about this diagram that's in the center of the slide here. This is an illustration of how um, COVID uh, can infect our cells. So I think it's useful just for a quick review here as we, uh, so we have that information before we get into the supplements. So as everybody knows at this point, uh, COVID is, uh, is an RNA uh, viral package. It's surrounded by a protein coat. That protein coat has spike proteins. Everyone's heard of the infamous spike proteins. And uh, in the corner of the slide here, you can see a, a, a representation of what COVID looks like as it's binding to the ACE receptor, which is in green. So it turns out that um, these spikes bind to ACE and they use other parts of our own cells to enter the cell. And once the COVID viral particle is in the cell, it actually hijacks our cellular machinery to um, trick our cells into replicating more viral proteins and more RNA 
and then pack packaging these into new COVID viral particles. And then those viral particles are excreted out of the cell and then others, they, they're free to infect other surrounding cells. So the, so the key thing here to remember is that COVID hijacks our own cellular machinery. Now, getting back to vitamin D, the rationale of why uh, vitamin D is of interest regarding COVID is because there was a study published um, last year in May, 2020, that showed that in the cell system and the cell culture system, vitamin D actually uh, regulated the genes that are required for COVID to enter the cell. And it turns out higher levels of vitamin D actually interfere with the production of the COVID-19 viral proteins. So based on this rationale, um, it was thought that maybe vitamin D could be helpful to prevent COVID. So with that in mind, um, let me comment on some of the human studies that have been done since that point. Um, in the last probably about six to 10 months, we've learned that people with low serum vitamin D levels actually have a greater chance of all respiratory infections, such as influenza and COVID. Uh, people with low serum vitamin D levels have an increased risk of becoming COVID positive. And if they do contract COVID, they actually have worse clinical outcomes. So based on that human data, um, it's fair to say that vitamin D can reduce the risk of infection and can uh, possibly even reduce the severity of infection. So this is an area of active research, even as we speak. At last count, there was actually 16 clinical trials underway where the object was to, to find out if, if uh, vitamin D treatment can cure COVID. So here's an example of one of these clinical trials I just listed on this slide. Now, these are all underway, so we don't have any information from them yet, but in about a year or so, um, we should have some data coming in from some of these clinical trials, which can actually tell us if vitamin D can be used as some sort of a treatment or a cure for COVID. But for now, there's enough information on vitamin D that we can answer this question. Should I take more vitamin D? Yes, the answer is definitely yes. So based on what we know about um, the observational trials, um, it could be useful to reduce the risk of contracting COVID. So the amount to take would be 1,000 to 2,000 international units. That's what the IEU stands for, international units per day. And um, if uh, that's a commonly found dosage you can get from any drugstore or grocery store. They do make vitamin D in higher dosages as well. You can buy a 5,000 IU dosage. You don't have to take that every day. That's something that can maybe just be taken two to three times a week. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, supplement and that's vitamin C. So what is the theoretical rationale behind vitamin C? Well, um, vitamin C in animal studies and some human studies has been shown to reduce inflammation. Specifically, it can reduce the production of inflammatory cytokines. Now, why is that important with regards to COVID? If you recall, you probably heard that severe COVID infections are often accompanied by a cytokine storm, and uh, that can lead to some of the complications that are, are seen in these severe cases. So the idea here is that maybe vitamin D can reduce that cytokine storm and, and reduce the severity of COVID infections. So um, it's a good theory, but right now we actually don't have any good evidence in, in humans. Um, there really hasn't been any studies that have been published looking specifically at vitamin C. There are a few uh, studies that have been published where vitamin C has been used with, with other treatments, you know, two or three or four other treatments, but it's hard to tease out the effect of vitamin C by itself from studies like that. So for that reason, um, we can't, we don't really know the answer to how effective vitamin C would be uh, by itself or not. Um, however, this is something that's being looked at uh, by my last count, there's four clinical trials underway now. And here's an example of one right here on, written on the slide. Um, there's four clinical trials underway to examine the efficacy of vitamin C as a treatment or as a therapeutic for COVID. But for now, because we don't have any um, good data in humans, I can't really recommend vitamin C as a tool for, for preventing COVID infection. So the answer, should I take vitamin C? I would say the answer is no. But I will say we should all eat more uh, fruits containing vitamin C because they are also a very good source of flavonoids. And if you were moved at all by Dr. Askew's talk, um, you, you, you can remember you can get a lot of flavonoids by eating fruits that contain vitamin C, such as citrus and strawberries.
Okay, so next nutrient on the list, and that is zinc. So zinc is a mineral, and the rationale for why we would be interested in zinc is because in cell culture studies, it has been shown to reduce replication of coronavirus. Now, remember, a cell study is different than a human or an animal study. Here, we're just talking about cells in a culture dish, but that's a promising uh, you know, piece of data. It's also been shown in um, animal studies that zinc, when it's in adequate status, can actually uh, reduce the expression of inflammatory cytokines in the lungs. So, and that has direct impact on COVID because that's one of the sites of the cytokine storm that people develop when they have severe COVID infection. Now, how about human data? Do we have any human data that um, corroborates any of this rationale for zinc? Well, there are some studies that have been done linking zinc status with COVID outcomes. And the summary of most of these studies points to the direction that those people who have a poor zinc status, in other words, they're marginal in their intake and they're, I don't wanna say they're deficient, but they have poor zinc status. They tend to have greater complications if they become COVID positive. So based on that rationale, there are now clinical trials underway to study zinc treatment. And here's a, an example of one. Um, so again, in about a year or a year and a half, we should have some data coming in from some of these clinical trials to give us a more specific answer on how useful zinc could be. Uh, for now though, I think we have enough information from some of these uh, observational studies that, that I can recommend, yes, you should take a zinc supplement uh, to try to prevent um, COVID infection, uh, particularly uh, if you happen to be a vegetarian or a vegan, because um, some of those good sources of zinc include animal products. So if that's not a part of your diet, you know, it may not be a bad idea to have a little bit of zinc as a supplement. Um, so how much zinc should we be looking for? It usually comes in a 30 milligram tablet. That's actually a lot of zinc. So taking that 30 milligram tablet, maybe two to three times a week uh, would be plenty. Uh, I don't think there's any need of taking zinc on a daily basis. Okay, the last supplement I'll talk about is fish oils or omega-3 oils. So um, the rationale of why we would be interested in fish oil is, be, is related back to that inflammation story. So it's been known for years that omega-3 fats from fish oil or other types of uh, products are anti-inflammatory. They can reduce um, you know, the effects of inflammation. So this may have a bearing on a cytokine storm that occurs in people with severe COVID infections. Now, unfortunately, there's really no good evidence in humans yet. I say yet because this is something that's being um, looked at with clinical trials right now as we speak. But there is no good evidence at this time that I can say you should take uh, omega-3 fats to prevent COVID. However, even though there's not a specific COVID link that we know about yet, I would still tell you, I do recommend to take a fish oil or an omega-3 oil supplement. And I say this because of prevention for cardiovascular disease, okay, CVD, cardiovascular disease, uh, because it is known that um, these omega-3 uh, fats can actually be uh, protective against different types of cardiovascular disease. Uh, as far as COVID goes, though, we're going to have to stay tuned until we get some results from these clinical trials. So how much fish oil should you take? Uh, 1,000 milligrams to 2,000 milligrams is a good range. Um, some of that, you know, will be dependent on what kind of product you decide to buy. But, but that amount taken daily is, a, is, a, is what I would recommend. Okay, so let's summarize then. Uh, what's the take-home message? Uh, we have to remember this is still pretty new. It's only been about a year since, you know, COVID entered our lives. So uh, evidence is still coming in. Clinical trials are being done. We will know more in about a year. But for now, um, you know, we do have enough uh, data to recommend these three nutrients, vitamin D, zinc, and fish oil. And uh, those are the doses, doses that we should be looking for. I will leave you in closing with one last thing regarding supplements in general. There is no rule that says we have to take supplements every day. If you look at those summaries, um, not everything you know, should be taken daily, for example, zinc. So the key word to supplement is supplement. It's a supplement to our diet. It's not a substitute to our diet. So make sure we're first focusing on healthy eating and then try to fill in the gaps or maybe use uh, supplements as a bit of therapy as we talked about for specific conditions. Thanks for your time. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the presentation.
Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And I'm thankful for the Alumni Association and the College of Health for allowing me to present tonight. I want to talk a little bit about um, recovery and this promise that we hear to feel young after we use certain recovery devices or program. But before I get into that, I want to maybe just start with a little bit of the benefits of exercise. And we've maybe seen these before, but we know when we exercise, we have better heart health, increase of bone density, increase of muscle mass, prevention of metabolic diseases such as uh, diabetes. We have better quality of sleep and increase in, in brain function. So you may have heard of the slogan when we look at uh, these benefits of exercise that we want more health and less medicine. But sometimes when we're starting our new exercise programs and when we're getting to the beginning of the year and we, we start those, sometimes when we're getting going after the first couple times of exercise, we may feel like this guy where we say, ouch, everything hurts. Maybe you're more of a, a cat person and you feel like this cat where you're just trying to figure out what muscles are not sore right now once you start those exercise programs. So we know that starting an exercise program and, and just participating in, in certain types of exercise could provide muscle soreness for us. We might see it be an immediate muscle soreness where we start to get muscle stiffness and tenderness or, or achy pain immediately after the exercise. Or you might see it start um, 24 hours after the exercise and something we call delayed onset muscle soreness. This will peak around 72 hours and may resolve uh, within five to seven days. But we know it significantly impacts our ability to perform activities of daily living. If you, uh, if you try to walk down the stairs with your, your legs sore, it, it definitely impacts how we, we function. If we look at this a little bit more from a cellular mechanism standpoint, when we have muscle, for, um, muscle soreness, there's a, a few different theories on how this occurs or what actually is happening from a physiological process. But kind of the basic theory is that we get a, a degradation of the muscles function, uh, functional unit called the sarcomere, where we see the microtrauma to the sarcomere, which creates this inflammatory response. Over time, as we continue to go through our, our exercise programs and we start to um, really uh, be consistent in those programs, uh, we start to develop adaptations. We might get a buildup of muscle, uh, which is called hypertrophy, and we might not feel as, as sore as we continue through these programs. Now, what happens when we, when we age and with our muscle soreness? When we age, we are a little bit more susceptible to muscle damage. We have some impairment in the way our muscles can regenerate and this may hamper the muscle remodeling process. However, like we just mentioned, um, there are some adaptations that occur. And what we find in, in the adaptations as we age is that we still have this good ability to adapt. Our muscles will, will continue to adapt, but it may take longer uh, than we were when we were younger. For example, if I go through an exercise program, it may take me three, two or three weeks more to have the same adaptations I would have had um, when I was in a younger state. Also, what's important when we age is we look at this aspect from a recovery standpoint. And here's a nice graph that Fell and Williams published in 2009 that when we see this from a younger athlete aspect that when they have a uh, exercise, intense exercise, we'll see this decrease in performance as we exercise and fatigue. We have this time period of recovery um, and during the younger athlete, we see this nice recovery that occurs. And then as, it, as we exercise again, we'll see this decrease, but over time we'll recover to the same level and eventually we'll get adaptations and, and actually improve our performance over time. However, in the, the veteran athlete, recovery is especially important. So we might have this intense exercise that decreases our performance as we fatigue. However, if we don't allow for proper recovery time, which may take longer as we um, exercise, or sorry, as we recover in the veteran athlete, um, the next time we exercise, we might have a decrease in performance and then continue to um, get this decrease as if we don't provide enough recovery time for that. 
So it's also, so it's very important to look at the recovery. So there's lots of things out there to help us recover. There's certain recovery clinics or um, practices that you might see in your community that you can go to. For example, a lot of times we think about cryotherapy and, and kind of in the old days, we would use a, a, a tub that we'd fill up with water and, and ice. Um, and you still see that in, in being used. But now there are these cryotherapy chambers that use nitrogen gas to cool uh, the body quickly. Um, and so we do a, a two to three minute treatment at a very low temperature, um, though safe. Um, and we provide that opportunity for that. Um, we also might see at these recovery clinics, we see these uh, cryotherapy devices that, that uh, push water, cold water through our joints. We might see these uh, Normatec devices that uh, use air to um, push the uh, blood out of the, the muscles and, and hopefully get new uh, blood flow across the, into the muscles. And then again, in these clinics, uh, newer devices occurred is these uh, light and laser therapy beds. So this is a, looks like a tanning bed, but it actually is a LEDs that use infrared and red light to produce uh, effects on the muscles. And again, we might see those in some of the recovery clinics in our, in our communities. There are some uh, tools that are marketed to, for us to just buy. Um, you can buy some of these on Amazon or different uh, websites. Um, you know, for an example, this is a, an LED light patch that uses red and blue light to stimulate recovery. Um, different device, different company will use uh, ultrasound or sound waves to stimulate different effects within the muscle. Um, we have massage uh, devices such as this percussion device. And we have for some of our traditional things like a foam, foam roller that occurs. Or we might just use the kind of the old traditional and we might do a stretching program after. So I, I want to kind of look and share some of the research that we've, pres we've been able to do in my research lab. Um, but one of the things that we see from research in this recovery is we do these at these universities. Um, kind of a convenient sample for us is to go over to our recreation centers and our student life center and be able to get these young, healthy, uh, physically active individuals. So we don't necessarily see um, a lot of research being done in, in more of the veteran athlete, but it's something that we definitely need to uh, continue to look at and some um, research that hopefully we'll be able to get through um, here soon. My research focuses on some of those light and laser therapy devices that, that I showed you. Um, the scientific term is photobiomodulation, which basically just shows that we have different sources of light, lasers, LEDs, broadband lights, um, that are in the visible and infrared spectrum. They create a physiological process for therapeutic outcomes. And when we look at what these therapeutic outcomes are, um, they are the, um, the most common one talked about is this increase in cell energy production. Um, and so in the cells, there's the uh, kind of the factory of energy production in the cells called the, called the mitochondria. The mitochondria, um, is stimulated by the light and laser therapy to increase production uh, through the uh, stimulation of some of these chromophores in, in the mitochondria. And if we think about, if we increase per energy production or ATP production in the cells, um, that we could use that for a lot of different uh, recovery and uh, preventing fatigue in certain areas. We also see that light and laser therapy can reduce inflammatory markers and um, can increase blood flow in, into certain areas. Now, again, uh, just like I showed you with, there's a lot of different recovery devices and there's a lot of different things in light and the laser that we're still learning about and different types of devices. For example, there's these LED and laser combination units that you might use, see in a, a cryopatric or, or physical therapy clinic. Um, there are single laser devices that have more high power and we're still learning on what the high power does versus a low power device. Um, again, I've shown you these LED um, uh, recovery beds and um, kind of the easiest thing to use again are these light patches that are really easy to, to stick on and to wear as you exercise um, or you're on your way to exercising. 
So let me show you a few studies that we've done and how we've looked at this. Um, the first study that we looked at is that we looked at bicep curls. Um, and we looked at this from a, an exhaustion standpoint. And so we uh, did this bicep curl, we did the treatment. Um, we had this red and blue light patch that was applied to the bicep versus a placebo treatment. We then, um, so some of the results of this, so they would do the bicep curl treatment, they would do the, uh, sorry, the bicep curls, the treatment, and then bicep curls again to fatigue. What we noticed in the active group is that um, there was a shift upward in the actual people that got a treatment. You can kind of see this. Um, now we still see fatigue um, in both cases of the active versus the placebo group, but you can see this shift upward. And in some cases, some of the active group actually did better after getting the treatment um, because they had that energy, that production from the treatment. This is also seen in some of the other studies that are done with red and infrared lasers, where again, we see this um, with an increase in um, production and in, in exercise after they've been given a, a laser light treatment. The next study that we looked at is that we looked at um, doing this on a larger muscle group. And we looked at um, doing this with a more kind of traditional laser therapy device uh, that produced infrared and uh, red light. We kind of switched up our uh, treatment a little bit or our exercise where they would do 10 seconds of contraction, 20 seconds rest, and they would do 40 repetitions. And the goal of this was to kind of mimic uh, more of an athletic event where you might have a normal football play is about eight to 10 seconds. They get about 20 seconds rest. And then an offense or a defensive player might do 40 repetitions. So again, what we found is, is again, they had fatigue, um, but we found that we had a, um, our active group had an, kind of this shift upward again, and where our placebo group you can see was much more fatigued, about 20% uh, lower production after the uh, fatiguing exercise where the laser group was only a, a few points lower. Our final, um, study that we looked at is there's some animal models that show that there are some three to, three to six uh, hours of, uh, of where we might be able to find the peak effects. So we looked at different treatment groups of immediate five hour and 24 hours with a, then a placebo group. And we applied the, the um, treatment at these time points before the exercise. Again, we went back to our, our light patch and these were the um, prototypes at that time point. And again, we see kind of something similar that the immediately before and five hours before had this kind of shift upward where our 24 hour and our placebo group was this downward trend where we found that we might be able to produce, um, give this light treatment and um, anywhere up to about five hours before, which is kind of helpful if you think about it, because a lot of times you're not going to have time to do a, a treatment right before you go do an exercise. Maybe you can wear a patch on your way to the activity or, or things. Now, looking at this and kind of comparing this to other recovery devices, um, then we this is a study by um, Leal Jr. et al. that looked at the light treatment versus cryotherapy or ice therapy. Um, and they had different uh, light treatments, which were the PBMT. And you can see anytime they added the laser to this, they had an increase in torque production. So again, this is torque. So they saw um, immediately after the exercise, they saw a decrease in, in muscle performance. But over the next few days, um, the people that had a laser therapy increased where the people that had the placebo and cryotherapy uh, didn't get quite the same increase in, in recovery. Similarly, when they looked at the subjective findings and they reported this, um, on the feelings of how people felt for the delayed onset muscle soreness, they had an ink, the uh, cryotherapy and the placebo group reported more and more muscle soreness, but any of the people that got the laser group um, felt much better, um, quicker for that, that group. So again, if we look at kind of the effects of this, as we increase cellular production of the energy, we're able to get better recovery, prevent fatigue, um, increase in 
uh, reduction of inflammatory markers where they felt better after the uh, recovered better and which helped with the increase in blood flow. Now this might be important as we look at maybe some activities. Uh, one, for example, is skiing. A lot of times we see, um, you know, at the end of the day, we see more fatigue and we see more injuries that occur at the end. If I can maybe put on a light patch or something uh, in the middle of the day or, or do a treatment before I, I head out, maybe I might not get as fatigued and I might be able to prevent a serious injury at the end of the day. Or if I wanna just make sure I, I maintain my, my exercise program, um, I can find some um, of these recovery devices like a light patch and be able to apply that um, and help me um, feel better so I can feel like I wanna do my exercises the next day. Now, um, here's a meta-analysis which takes all these randomized control studies and they kind of compare them all in this one study. And this was done by Dupe et al. in 2018. Now they didn't include um, light and laser therapy, but they had other types of, of recovery modalities that they looked at. And the number one uh, modality that they found was best for recovery um, was massage. And so we can look at this in, in some of the other ways. Again, a foam roller might help. Um, we can do these per percussion massage devices, or you can just go get a, um, a general good massage um, at, a, at a clinic. The next type of recovery that they found was the cryotherapy and compression devices. So again, there's different cryotherapy options that you can apply, um, or there's different compression devices like those Normatec boots that we showed here. Um, but when we look at all of the research together and we look at what's best for recovery, the best process is being able to get a good night's sleep. And hopefully you're like this kid and you're gonna sleep like a baby. So being able to develop good sleeping habits is the best option for trying to recover um, from exercise and, and make sure that we're ready for our next bout. And with that, I say thank you. Hi, I am so happy to be with you today uh, to chat about one of my favorite subjects, which is how to start and stick with an exercise program. Deciding to be physically active is one of the very best things you can do for your health. Regular physical activity benefits physical, mental, and emotional health and it helps you maintain independence as you age. So how much exercise do you need? The physical activity guidelines for Americans recommend that each individual include three to seven days per week of physical activity, aim for 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise. So that is brisk walking, cycling, hiking, or dancing. If you prefer vigorous exercise like running, you can aim for 75 minutes. Additionally, you want to try to get at least two days a week of muscle strengthening activities like weight training or exercises like push-ups and lunges. If you're considering adding exercise to your daily routine or significantly increasing your level of physical activity, check in with your doctor first. At your appointment, ask the following questions. Is my preventive care up to date? Are there any exercises or activities I should avoid? And finally, how does my health condition affect my ability to exercise? Your doctor can make recommendations based on your health history, keeping in mind any recent surgeries or ongoing health conditions. If you've had trouble sticking with an exercise program in the past, you're not alone. Many of us struggle to get regular physical activity despite our best intentions. So I've compiled eight of my favorite tips to help you stick with your exercise program. The first tip is pretty obvious, but find activities that you enjoy. Your friends might love CrossFit or indoor cycling but if you don't like to do those things, you will not stick with your exercise program. 
So if you don't have an exercise that you love or several that you like to do, start with a list of things you enjoy. That list might include being out in nature or um, motivating music, being in a group. After you've made your list, look for activities that meet more, one or more of your criteria. So here is a not comprehensive list of some physical activities that you might enjoy. So if you're someone who loves music and likes to be in a group setting, maybe Zumba or ballroom dancing is going to be something that you really connect with. I have a friend who's always excited to ride her stationary bike, which sounds very boring to me, but she waits to watch her TV shows until she's on the bike. So she's always motivated to get out and get on that bike, get in and get on that bike. Tip number two is to start smart. You don't want to start too fast and get injured or be too sore to continue your activity. Start slowly with low intensity exercises and then you can increase as your fitness level increases. Warm up before exercise and cool down afterward. This will decrease your risk of injury. And consider meeting with a trainer or coach. Getting advice from a knowledgeable person can take the guesswork away from what exercises to do or how hard you should be working. Tip number three is add it in and break it up. So since I have been sitting for almost an hour now and maybe you have too, I'm going to add a physical activity break in right now to my talk. I'd ask you to join me if you would like. If you can stand, if you're able to, Go ahead and stand up. You can also do this activity from your chair if it's safer for you to do so. Right now, I just want you to start marching in place. So you're just marching, getting your knees up, kind of getting your blood flowing a little bit. Now, if this is good, or if you're sitting down and you're moving just your knees up and down, if you feel pretty good here, you can keep doing this. I'm gonna do some, a little bit of a harder exercise, which is a um, chair squat. So I'm gonna sit down in my chair and stand back up and sit down and stand up. And if you're joining me, you think about these big muscle groups that we're activating right now, just getting that blood flowing and pumping, maybe one more of these and stand back up. And I want you to push your hands out, bring it in and push it out. When you bring your elbows back, try to touch them together in, the back, in your back, behind your back. Squeeze your shoulder blades together and push out. Squeeze and push out. Let's do some shoulder rolls all the way up, all the way back, all the way down. Nice full range of motion shoulder rolls and roll the other direction. Big shoulder rolls. Now I want you to reach up over your head with one arm and reach for the other arm. Let's do a few of these. Each time maybe getting a little bit better stretch, just feeling that body move. Reach up, we're gonna take three deep breaths. So inhale, reach up toward the ceiling and exhale. We're gonna do two more. This one's gonna be a little bigger. Inhale, reach up, reach, 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 and exhale. And we're gonna do one more. This is the last thing, inhale up reach and exhale. Now you can join me back sitting position or you can stay standing of course. Um, I always feel better and more energized after I take a second to move. So you can add physical activity to your day by adding movement breaks. Also look for opportunities to add physical activity. So take the stairs, park farther away. Think about trying to create activity in your social life. So if you have a friend who usually meets you for coffee, maybe you're gonna meet for a walk next time or a pickleball game. Um, another uh, idea you can do is to break up your exercise. So research has shown us that one 30 minute bout of exercise has almost identical benefits to three 10 minute bouts of exercise. So if you have a super busy day ahead of you, just get out and do a couple of 10 minute bouts and you'll be good to go. Tip number four is to build in support. Studies have shown that people are more likely to stick with their exercise program if they have social support. 
make sure the people in your life know that you're making the commitment to be physically active. Your social support or accountability partners in your life can be a wellness coach or trainer, a friend, a class or a team. Looking for a good accountability partner includes uh, making sure you're, you've got someone in your life who's positive and motivating. If you're finding a workout buddy, ideally they have a similar level of health, fitness, or ability to you. So one of you is not always waiting for the other person. And having more than one accountability partner in your life really improves your chances of success. Tip number five is perfect the timing. You may have heard that working out in the morning is the best time to work out. And it's true, some people find it easier to stick with their workout plans if they do it in the morning before anything else comes up to stop them from doing it. However, if working out in the morning, early morning sounds like torture to you, you're probably not going to stick with that exercise program. So try different times of day, maybe a lunch hour uh, workout is the best for you or working out in the evening might be the perfect transition between your work and home life. There is no one size fits all answer. After you've found the correct time, put it in your calendar. I would encourage you to schedule your physical activity on your calendar like any other important appointment. The idea here is you're making exercise a priority and you're going to treat it like any other appointment. So you probably wouldn't skip your dentist appointment to go grocery shopping. Do the same for your exercise. You can also consider a class that meets at a certain time or a personal training appointment or meeting a friend if that helps you get it on the schedule and prioritize. Tip number seven is to be prepared. Even the smallest obstacles, like having to change into workout clothes before heading to the gym, can mean the difference between working out and skipping it. So fix that problem. If you can, you can put on your exercise clothes when you wake up in the morning. That way, when it's time to exercise, you have one less thing to think about that you have to do before you get out the door. If that's not realistic for you, have your exercise clothes packed in a duffel bag, ready to go, and then take them with you when you head out to work for the day. Also, I'd encourage you to have a plan B workout. So in the event, it's inevitable, something comes up sometimes and you can't do your whole workout. You don't just bag exercise for the whole day. There are a variety of seven minute workouts that are online and available as apps um, that are really super fun and you can get your, a good workout in in seven minutes. Tip number eight is to ditch the all or nothing attitude. Among my clients, the concept of all or nothing behavior around fitness is really common. It's the tendency to operate in extremes. You're either all in pushing 110% through your regimented workout routine every day without fail, or you missed a day and you say, well, you know, now I failed, I'm done with working out. You wanna be realistic and flexible. If this is a habit that you want to maintain throughout your life, you're, you gotta cut yourself some slack. I like to think of exercise pro, my exercise program like a habit similar to brushing my teeth. So there have been days when I'm too tired at night, I forget, I get stressed, I go to bed without brushing my teeth. I have never woken up the next morning and said, oh, I failed the toothbrushing thing. I'm just gonna quit or maybe I'll start again next month. Nope, you just get up and you brush your teeth and you move on. So you wanna give yourself some slack with that. Do the same with exercise. Um, a really good way to think about exercise is five minutes of activity beats zero minutes. And that consistency leads to success. So finally, um, I would like to encourage all of you to make physical activity a regular part of your day. Success is not about having a perfect workout every time. It's about moving your body over weeks and months and years. Thank you.
Hi, uh, my name is Dart Schmaltz, and I'd like to take this opportunity to start by thanking Dean Perrin and the College of Health Alumni Association for having us here tonight. Uh, I'm really excited and pleased to represent the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism. And I think I speak on behalf of my colleague, uh, Camilla Hodge as well, that we are excited to be here and to share with you some of what we do that, result, that relates to healthy aging uh, and well-being across the lifespan. So my particular interest in recreation and leisure as it relates to health is mostly in regards to the perspective of positive psychology. And positive psychologists are more and more contending that uh, having a positive mental attitude is as important in healthy aging as having a positive physical health, healthy uh, body. Uh, and our state of mind is affected by our behaviors and what we do, what we engage in, and also the personality and the attitudes we bring to the behaviors that we participate in. So one of the experts in this idea of a healthy state of mind is right here in the Department of Psychology at the University of Utah. His name is Ed Diener, and he looks at state of mind through this lens of subjective well-being. And in the research that they have done on subjective well-being, they've identified it as, comp as being comprised of three components. We have our perceived happiness, uh, our perceived life satisfaction, and whether or not we have a, a sense of, well, uh, excuse me, a sense of purpose or meaningfulness to the life that we are living. They further broken down um, subjective well-being to five life domains. And these particular life domains are vary in the degree to which we can control them, especially once we reach a certain life stage. Uh, for instance, uh, we don't have a lot of control of all of these things. And I'll point out one example is that I'm sure at one point or another, all of us have wished that we might have been able to control who our family members are. Kind of out of our control for the most part. Health is another example. We might be genetically predisposed to one condition or another that uh, makes it, but we just can't control that. It's simply not something that's within our auspices or under our umbrellas of control. Uh, but there are certain decisions that we might have made earlier in our lives that have affected our health and for that matter might have affected our family or the group of people that we find ourselves spending time with. Our socioeconomic status also might be affected by decisions we made earlier in our life. Point being that when we reach a certain life stage, there's not a lot we can do about it. Um, as for our work, uh, I hope that all of you, or mo at least most of you, were fortunate enough to do something during your working lives that gave you a sense of purpose and meaningfulness. Um, and we could, you can still get that at, you know, in your later life stage. In fact, developmental psychologists from the 1960s identified that um, the life transition of getting up into or getting into later life is, um, determined by this idea of generativity. And generativity is defined as being able to give back or sharing some sort of expertise or knowledge with generations that are coming up behind you. Uh, and that in and of itself, being able to engage in some sort of sharing of your expertise to other people is a very positive um, form or can contribute to our psychology later in life. And so I encourage you, if you're not already doing it, get out there and do something that makes you feel as though you're giving back. It might be working in a paid job again. It might be volunteering with the community or with your church or something like that. But the, the one thing that I really want to identify is that leisure and hobbies is also a predictive life domain of our subjective well-being. And what's unique about leisure and hobbies is that it's the one thing among all the life domains that predicts subjective well-being over which we have complete control. We decide what we're gonna engage in. We decide what we're gonna do. Um, and leisure is defined by scholars as activities or experiences that we participate in, that we, are intrins that we find intrinsic enjoyment, that we don't have any sort of sense of obligation or evaluation. We have a sense of control over what we're doing in that activity. We have perceived competence in that activity. So ultimately we walk away from that activity or that experience with a positive affect in which we feel good about ourselves, we feel good about our lives, uh, and it just overall enhances our quality of life. Uh, we also know that having a robust and diverse uh, variety of leisure activities that we participate in uh, helps us successfully navigate life transitions. It can help us navigate or 
cope with negative life events and contributes to our overall optimism. It contributes to our joie de vivre and just makes our lives more joyful if we have this variety of leisure activities. So research exploring the direct link between leisure and subjective well-being has been shown that leisure is more so is more highly significant and a better predictor of subjective well-being later in life and for people post-retirement than it is even for people pre-retirement. So making sure you have that variety of leisure activities and finding something that you really like to engage in, not unlike what uh, my colleague Tracy Thompson was talking about just a few minutes ago, is really important. And just like she indicated, not, there's not one activity that's going to solve it for everybody. For some of you out there, participating in tennis is more, is more enjoyable and more fun than participating in fly fishing, while somebody else might love to get out there on the river and do some fly fishing. For others of you, Doing reading or writing is really important and valuable and gives you that positive affect that is so incredibly important to our mental health and our subjective well being. Having said that, I do want to get into some details about how or what we know about leisure activities um, and how different activities or things that are important that are more valuable, even though a sedentary activity might give you that positive aspect that, that is so valuable and so important, there are certain qualities of certain activities that are more valuable than others. For instance, being social is more valuable than being solitary. For all you introverts out there, I'm with you. I'm an introvert too, and I would prefer sometimes to just be on my own. But the research supports that getting out there and being social, having people you enjoy doing things with, is more beneficial to your subjective well being than doing it on your own. My colleague Camilla Hodge is going to get into more detail on that, so I won't dwell anymore on that. Being open and positive to new experiences and trying new things is better for us than being closed off and bringing a negative attitude to the things we do. So trying to have that more agreeable attitude and personality is more beneficial for you than having that closed off or negative attitude. I hope all of you know, if you don't, you've missed the memo, especially having been attending these presentations here tonight. Being active is more valuable than being passive. Uh, so I'm not gonna reiterate that. What nobody has touched on here and what I think people generally don't touch on as much as some of these other things is that being outdoors is more valuable than being indoors. In fact, participating in the same activity for the same amount of time at the same exertion is more valuable and more beneficial to our mental, physical and emotional health than participating in that same activity indoors. So let's get into some details. Why is it that participating in an activity outdoors is so valuable? Well, we know from the research that we're exposed to more oxygen, we get more vitamin D, uh, our bodies release more positive mood enhancing hormones such as serotonin when we're outdoors. Um, we end up sleeping better because our senses are more stimulated in general when we're outdoors. And all of this combined leads to us just naturally wanting and motivated to be more active. Scholars call this green exercise. Uh, in fact, uh, research meta-analyses and systematic reviews of the existing literature show consistent results that participating in activities outside uh, lead to mental health outcomes, including increased cognition, attention, and mood, and also can reduce our levels, naturally reduces our levels of stress and our anxiety. Increasing research is showing that nature-based recreation or this green exercise is a positive and valuable intervention for treating clinically diagnosable mental health conditions, such as post-traumatic stress and depression as well. As kind of an interesting aside uh, that I wanted to throw in, uh, there's recently been some data published that directly links green exercise in urban areas with reduced crime and violence as well. So clearly being outdoors just causes us to calm down and relax and be more patient and have this general overall better sense of mental health and well-being. So another point of uh, interest that I wanted to be sure to raise with you all tonight what has to do with what is it? I mean, okay, we're exposed to more oxygen. We're more motivated to be active. All of these great things. Okay, but is there anything that's really objective behind this? And the answer is yes, there is in fact something more objective behind this. 
In the 1920s, scientists identified an, anti an antimicrobial compound that plants release that they call phytoncides. And phytoncides are, you know, different plants release different phytoncides. Uh, but what we do know, and there's some research that's coming out specifically identifying what phytoncides are released by what plants. And so different plants and different trees might have different effects on our bodies. But we do know that is in general, in a wooded area or in a, a green area that has a variety of different plants in it, we are exposed to these phytoncides that boost our immunity. They're anti-inflammatory, they increase our mood. So there's something about what we're breathing in when we're out in nature that physically, physiologically helps us. Now, these phytoncides have been used in the last several decades in Eastern medicine for complementary uh, and sort of integrative holistic healthcare. Uh, but more and more, we're starting to adopt it over here on the, in the West as well. So you, I, I don't know if you'll hear about phytoncides necessarily. Now you have. Um, but you probably have, I hope you've started to hear more and more about the value of engaging in it recreation and leisure activities outdoors. To that end, I wanted to give a little plug to some projects that are going on here in the Salt Lake area. Um, and actually nationally, there are some programs going on called Nature RX or Park RX. Some of you may have heard about them. But in these programs, the idea is that physicians, health coaches, um, nurses prescribe nature and parks as a healthcare tool to get people outside to reap the benefits of participating in nature-based or green recreation. We here at the University of Utah in, a, uh, in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism in a partnership with U of U Health and the Huntsman Cancer Institute, as well as community organizations and community um, services such as the Salt Lake County Public Health Department and the Salt Lake County Parks Department are working to all together to put together a Parks, and Rec or a Parks Rx program um, that will hopefully link our healthcare providers. I do this because the university healthcare system is in that direction for me. Uh, the University of Utah Healthcare with programs downtown that are, that are offered down in our parks. So this is still in its elementary stages. So you might not have heard about it yet. We're doing some pilot testing to see how we can work out some kinks and whatnot. Um, but, and it's also a little bit difficult because of COVID and all the rest. But I hope once COVID and once we get out of this particular situation that you will keep an eye on the College of Health and you'll see this um, coming to a park near you. But without further ado, I'll turn things over to my colleague, Camilla Hodge. Thanks, Dirt. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's great to learn from you about nature and its effects on, on health as we age, especially nature in our, in our leisure time. Uh, I am going to pivot just a little bit now uh, to talk about leisure and social connection. So in this brief presentation, uh, I'm going to answer three questions. What are the benefits of being socially connected? How are leisure and social connection linked? And how can we design leisure to support social connection? So first, let's talk about uh, the benefits of being socially connected. Uh, the benefits, as it turns out, are pretty far reaching and significant. Being socially connected, uh, that is having a high quality or having high quality relationships with several people is associated with a 50% chance of longevity, or in other words, being socially connected can affect how long we live. Being socially connected is also associated with stronger gene expression for immunity, higher self-esteem and empathy, better emotion regulation, and lower rates of anxiety and depression. Taken together, these benefits all affect our social, emotional, and physical health. Interestingly, Utah has been rated as the state with the lowest prevalence of social isolation in older adults, or in other words, older adults in Utah are some of the best socially connected in the nation. Now let's talk about how leisure is linked to social connection. Many, if not all of us are familiar with the popular phrase, the family or couple or other fill in the blank relationship uh, that plays together stays together. Well, as it turns out, there is some research to support this, this saying. Leisure scholars and psychologists have observed that friendship and attachment are constructed around shared experience, shared enjoyment and understanding and familiarity. 
And as Dart taught us, leisure is characterized by positive emotion. Therefore, shared leisure experiences that create shared enjoyment are likely to support our connections to other people. Likewise, we know that leisure is a major source of, or a major social space for the development and maintenance of relationships. That means when we think about building new relationships and keeping our current relationships healthy, we should be thinking about how we use our leisure. That leads me to the third and final section of my talk tonight, designing leisure to enhance social connection. Now we all probably know from personal experience with family road trips or camping trips or even game nights that sharing leisure doesn't necessarily always help us build better relationships. Uh, Monopoly, for example, was eventually banned in my household because it most certainly was not improving my family's relationships. So leisure won't automatically or inherently help us with our social connection. We need to be thinking about the dimensions of a leisure experience that we can design to increase the likelihood that our leisure supports better relationships. Here's where the family activity model comes in handy. Now, although this is titled the family activity model, the principles it describes can be applied to any social relationship. What my colleague and I, Dr. Karen Melton, have determined is that there are two main dimensions to every leisure experience that are likely to affect social connection. And these are social interaction and incongruity of the activity environment. When these two dimensions intersect, they give us four broad categories of activities that affect social connection in different ways. This means we can target certain social experiences and social connection outcomes by designing activities that meet the criteria of any given category in the model. So let's talk about social interaction first. Social interaction is the exchanges verbal and nonverbal that occur between two or more individuals during a shared activity. Social interaction ranges from what we might most th commonly think of, that is verbal communication to our body orientation. For example, are we facing toward or away from our partner? I've listed some examples of social interaction behaviors that occur in shared leisure activities on the right hand of the slide. Using these social interaction behaviors, you can change the leisure experience you have with others by changing the types or quantities of social interactions you engage in. In one experimental study of romantic couples, activities that created more opportunities for affectionate touch, in this case, it was a couple's painting night in which partners would put their arms around each other as they looked at each other's paintings. These activities resulted in more oxytocin release than the activity of playing a board game together. Oxytocin is a neuropeptide that is linked to social behaviors like attachment and trust. Thus, releasing more oxytocin likely indicates that some kind of social connection is happening. Interestingly, leisure in natural spaces stimulates social interaction. That means the setting in which your leisure takes place can also affect social connection. And the leisure setting is in fact the second dimension of the family activity model. Incongruity of the activity environment essentially describes the extent to which an activity or the environment in which that activity is taking place is new, novel, challenging, or distracting. As you can see, just like with social interaction, I have listed some specific mechanisms that can increase or decrease the incongruity of an activity. Again, through experimental research, we have determined that just being in a new place, not even engaging in leisure yet, <laughs> romantic couples experienced an increase in their oxytocin release. Again, an indicator that social connection may be happening. And as Dar taught us, not only does nature improve our physical health, but it also facilitates awe and fascination and improves our mood, all of which can help us connect better to other people. Research on designing leisure to support social connection is still ongoing. What I can tell you for now is that the best way to use leisure to support your social connection is by diversifying your leisure, or in other words, trying new things. Not only does novelty or newness affect the activity environment, but it also affects the way we interact. For example, do you and your partner uh, or family have a, a movie night on, for, uh, for example, a Friday night movie tradition? If so, what if you move the movie outdoors? By simply changing the location, the emotions you feel and the way you interact with each other will also change. 
We in the College of Health invite you to intentionally design your leisure to help you stay healthier and happier. Well, thanks so much colleagues for such an insightful discussion on some of the health issues that we may all face as we age and how research is supporting a healthy process to reduce and cope with these issues. To our audience, I hope each of you feels more empowered to speak with your loved ones and your healthcare providers about what you've learned uh, this evening. We have a few minutes, I think about 10 minutes uh, for questions. And uh, so uh, uh, we have more questions from our wonderful audience than we'll have time to get to, but we can get to a few. Uh, Thunder or Wayne? Uh, I, I have these uh, multivitamins. I don't know if you can see them. They say, it says silver on them, but. Yeah, is that Centrum? Centrum silver, of course I have to take the silver. But uh, the question is, are, are daily multivitamins a, 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 a suitable source for uh, some of the supplements that you addressed in, for, uh, as a strategy to perhaps prevent or reduce severity of COVID? Um, kind of. It's not the optimal source, but it could be okay. Um, there's kind of two main issues with it. One is that the dosages that I refer to with zinc and vitamin D um, are typically lower in a multivitamin mineral supplement. So um, it may be anywhere from kind of a half to a third in most of them. Now you can get some where like the vitamin D dosage is just about the same, maybe a thousand IU, but in general, it's just one of the lowest. And you get a lot of stuff you don't actually need. So you're probably paying more money for that because the other supplements are pretty cheap standalone. And then the last point is the omega-3 fats are not typically found in like your centrum or other multivitamins. Okay, great, Thunder. Wayne, anything to add to that? Uh, as you age, your metabolic rate decreases, uh, Dave, and uh, food intake in decreases also. So this kind of uh, runs against adequate uh, vitamin and mineral intake, depending upon how wise your, your diet is chosen. So it's kind of a, uh, an insurance policy. If you're not the wisest uh, uh, diet balancer as you get older and you're eating less, if you supplement it with a multivitamin, uh, it's, it's fairly good insurance and, uh, and not, re not going to cause any harm. So I think it's a good idea. Okay, thanks. Thanks to you both. Hey, Justin, in the last Olympics, I noticed some of these swimmers had these really funny marks on their shoulders and their backs. And... Uh, as I looked into that, I, I learned that that's called cupping. And uh, I'm wondering if this you know, thing called cupping is, is what, what do we know about it? Is it effective in, in, in reducing some of the pain and the disability that you talked about? Yeah, Dave, this uh, is a great question. Um, you know, cupping has become, and we see this with some, some certain treatment devices like this, that when our professional athletes use it, um, we get an increase in popularity of these devices. Cupping has been around for quite a while now um, and is kind of a traditional Chinese medicine, but um, has become definitely more popular um, with our athletes here at, at the University of Utah and uh, other places. Um, now the research with cupping, I think is still inconclusive. The, there's um, some evidence that shows it's good and some evidence is bad. Now, now I wouldn't necessarily take to mean that that cupping is not good at reducing pain, but I think cupping, um, some of the things that we have to think about when we look at the research with these certain devices that, is that when we treat our patients is that um, finding a good device that works for them. And so some patients that I treat, cupping works very well with them um, and they really prefer that treatment where some patients might. So finding a good clinician, a good physical therapist or athletic training that really works with you to figure out what your problem is and provides that treatment um, and cupping can definitely be one of those options. Okay, great, Justin, thanks. And Tracy, let's say one is in their 70s. What would you recommend as the, maybe the safest and the best uh, form of aerobic exercise while minimizing the risk of injuring oneself? 
so as I would recommend some safe, low intent or low impact aerobic activities. Walking is always great. Water aerobics, hiking, dancing, even. Um, and I would say that my one of my huge recommendations for people of every age is to start a safe resistance training program. Even if you're 70, even if you're 80, even if you're 90, you can gain strength, balance, um, real quality of life benefits from resistance training. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, you should get with a professional to get you on the right track. But um, resistance training is really popular. And I would recommend a combination of both aerobic exercise and strength training. Okay, great, Tracy, thanks. And, and I would mention that one of our very favorite retired faculty who is 95, 96 now, yep. uh, participates every week in Tracy's Peak uh, program and still gets her physical activity. So it's just wonderful. Okay, Dart, uh, you've really identified the value of out, the outdoors um, for, for uh, health and wellness. Is there any research that recommends a certain amount of time uh, one should spend outdoors to reap these positive benefits? Uh, Dave, that's actually an excellent question. And in fact, it's one that is very popular right now among people who study nature-based recreation and the benefits of the outdoors is this question of dosage. Uh, right now, the most cited article is one that was published in 2019 and is based on some clinical trials and they deduced that uh, about 120 minutes a week is ideal. So that averages out to, I don't know, go from 15 to 45 minutes a day of exposure is the ideal amount of time to reap the benefits of the outdoor environment. Okay, great. And Camilla, I, I have a question here that I, that I assume is, is a, a correct premise, but you, you would know. Why do Utahns have the lowest prevalence of social isolation? So there are a number of factors that play into that. One of the most, I think, relevant is that there is a low prevalence of um, older adults who, without, without family members in the area. And so uh, in terms of why uh, older adults in Utah are so well connected or socially connected, it's because they have, they have good, strong family ties. Okay, great. Well, we're about out of time. Colleagues, again, thank you so much. And to our audience, uh, you can see why I so enjoy working with such a brilliant group of faculty uh, in the College of Health, all toward the endpoint of more health, less medicine, as you heard in one of the presentations. Uh, this evening's seminar was recorded and will be available on YouTube. And so feel free um, to uh, access that and, and to share that uh, with your uh, friends and neighbors and family. And uh, thank you all uh, for attending this evening and stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you and good night.